Boom production. So I started teaching this, this is my fourth year teaching this class. And really everybody kind of does film production different. Um, so I tried to gather as much as I could and just give, give you the basics of what most people do, how most people do things. So let me give you the process. So the filmmaking process. So each stage is kind of a prep for the next stage. So filmmaking process. The first stage is what we call the development. So what do you think is in this stage of filmmaking? Asher? Like casting and um, writing the script story all together yep so casting and just because you don't know the next process which is pre-production that would fall into pre-production but definitely writing the script you can't make a movie without developing a script so yes so script and storyboard if it's applicable but um, so all of these most of these can be skipped except the actual production and a little bit of post but technically, I could just post this online as is. I don't have to do any post-production. But I'm going to take it back and edit a little bit and maybe take out some stuttering parts or whatever. Um, maybe put some hair on my head. No, I don't need hair. Hair is overrated. I'm talking to you too. <laughs> so hair is overrated and annoying. So development, so basically this can be rushed or even skipped, okay? You could go out and just decide to make a movie. Let's make a movie, go. <laughs> so you don't have to write a script. Um, obviously these things are important and it's nice to have that and to know what you're doing going in and it makes things go by a lot smoother and quicker, but you don't even have to have this process okay so this is where your theme and story are developed so as a result of that you're gonna have some type of script and this could just be in your head of what you want but you could have a storyboard so why do we do storyboards? Why do you see, have you guys seen those behind the scenes of like, um, I watched behind the scenes of Star Wars and they had all these pictures up here, all this, basically a storyboard of what was happening. Like people spend a lot of time making it look like there's like, there's good art on there. Why do people do that? Why do people have a storyboard? Why can't you just have a script? Yeah, you know, so you're vi very visual. <laughs> You want to see what it's going to look like um, for a cinematographer for, or a director of photography who's actually in charge of how the camera is going to be set and the angles of the camera. It's nice to have like these, like some storyboards, like you could have like this cool shot through a window or something. So having that on a storyboard is just a good reminder of this scene's going to work great if it's shot like this on a camera. Okay, so that's development. So number two, I already said, was pre-production. Okay, so pre-production, cast and crew development. Okay, so cast and crew development, you would have like auditions for cast and things like that. Those are always a fun process. Um, they can be really intimidating. Um, um, Asher, have you auditioned for anything like that? No. So um, if you're pursuing acting, you should definitely consider like an agent, or like an agency type of thing. And usually those, you don't have to really pay to do that, but an agency would get like a commission type of thing. But, um, but yeah, when we, we, when we did auditions, we basically posted an ad and gave it to all these agencies, and then they sent a bunch of actors our way, and they auditioned. Um, and crew development, 
crew is nice if they just want to help out. <laughs> but obviously, in the real world, um, you have to pay. You have to pay crew and you have to pay cast. And that, they should be paid. Um, but a lot of our productions were volunteer-based. So crew just wanted to learn the trade a little bit and be a part of what's going on. So they would come and hang out and help out. And that's awesome. Um, but it is nice to pay people because as you guys know that when someone is paid for doing something, there's sometimes there's a little bit more ownership and more accountability to get the job done nice and well. But you can get that with volunteers, but you know, it's, it's nice when they have a little bit more of an incentive. Okay, so cast and crew development. Um, then we've got, uh, what else? Set building and location scouting. Okay. So set building, that's like props and stuff like that. But you can also, if you're doing the studio filming, like inside of a studio, you would have to actually construct a set. A lot like theater and things like that. Um, but then you've got location scouting too. So what we mostly do is location-based filming, okay? So that means, oh, there's, there's a dancer in our movie, so we need a dance studio. So we went and talked to a bunch of dance studios in town and said, hey, would you be willing to um, have us come in and film a couple scenes in our movie? And they would say, um, what does that mean? And then we try to prepare them for what that actually means. Um, if it's during the day, then, okay, here's what it means. You can be there, but you can't move. You can't talk. You can't run the air conditioner. You can't walk around upstairs. You can't do any of that. Do you still want us to come? And, and most of them say yes, because they don't realize <laughs> that we really mean it. Because audio wise too, like we want it to be good audio. And if there's some people walking around or even, even the air conditioner is very loud and can be very annoying in the audio. So sometimes we have to turn the air off and it's like 100 degrees outside. And so that gets a little uncomfortable. So location scouting, but a lot of times in a place of business, like a dance studio, they allow, they give us the keys and say, okay, can you film during the night? Yeah. And so we film during the night when no, when it's not being used, or we don't have to worry about anyone making sounds or things like that. Um, if there are, things making sounds, then you should probably go to another location. But usually in the middle of the night is a great place and a great time to film. Okay, so that's location scouting. Um, what else we got in pre-production? We got rehearsal and film schedule, okay? So this is really tricky. Rehearsal, a lot of times we'll have time to rehearse, but sometimes it's just in the moment. So the thing about film is it's nice to memorize your lines, but do you really have to memorize your lines in film? Are you performing it live? No. So uh, the director likes it when you remember your lines, and that way um, they don't have to keep giving you lines. And then nice, it's nice to have one take um, but a lot of times you don't remember your lines and sometimes you do your lines different every time. But having a rehearsal is nice because you can block it. So blocking it out means basically, okay, you're going to come in in this direction and stand here and talk. You're going to move to the couch and continue the conversation type of thing. Um, and, so, and so rehearsal is nice, but it's not terribly necessary because when you get on set, things are, might change anyway. Um, and then when you do a scene, sometimes you'll do it literally 30 times. So most, most scenes are filmed with one camera, so they don't have multiple cameras. Um, the last production we had, we had multiple cameras, but it takes a while to set those up. But you can just do it with one camera. You can do a wide shot, and then you do it again. You move in. You do an over-the-shoulder shot of this perspective. And then you move to the other side and do an over the shoulder shot of this perspective, this person's reaction to a conversation. And then you can do like a mid shot, like of the two of them facing off type of thing. 
So you've got like all these different angles for the same scene. So sometimes you're doing it the same way 20 times. And 20 is a good safe number. It's usually about 20 times. All right, um, so that's pre-production. Well, what comes after pre-production? Production. All right, so I'm not gonna say much about this. This is where, when you think of filming, this is what you think of. This is, this is basically the, the actual filming process, okay? So there is a little bit of rehearsing there. So this is on-site rehearsing. Okay, and that's, that's unavoidable. Even if you've rehearsed for a year in preparation for this film, you're still gonna rehearse more on set because it's gonna look different, it's gonna feel different, um, it's gonna be different. So that's production. What comes after production? Fix it in, you guys know that saying? We'll just fix it in post. You never wanna say that when you're on set filming, like, oh, we'll just fix it in post. That's a terrible thing to say. Nobody wants to hear that. But the reality is we do fix a lot of things in post-production. So this is where all the editing happens and the coloring, um, all the music, all the, all the visual effects. So special effects happen on set. Visual effects will happen after, okay? So if you've seen any uh, behind the scenes of like Marvel movies and stuff, you'll see big, huge green screens or blue screens, depending on the superhero and what they're wearing. <laughs> so Loki doesn't get a green screen because he's green. So he gets a big blue screen. It doesn't have to be green. It just has to be a solid color. But green is the best for skin tone because that we do have a little bit of other color in our faces. So when we like if we had a red screen behind us, then it would take out some of our face because we have a little bit of red in our faces. So anyway, green screen, but what's happening is they're setting up for visual effects, okay? So New York being destroyed in Avengers, it's, uh, that was basically a bunch of green screen. And then, so they, they, those aren't special effects, those are visual effects, okay? All right, this, oh, I don't know why I picked up my math now. These are, that's not what we're doing. So post-production. So this is your editing process. Okay, and there's two types of editing. There's linear and non-linear. Um, most uh, editing programs, editing software is very linear. It has a timeline. And that's usually the way people like to edit. Um, and then after post-production, so editing, let, let's, let's just, there's a lot of things that are part of editing. So you're fixing stuff, you're putting clips together, you're putting angles together. That's, that's really fun, especially if someone's sitting down, you're filming someone sitting down at one angle, and then they get up. It's fun to like try to make it look like it's the same tape. That's the goal, is to make it look like it's all, the, it's happening live, right? Um, but really what happens is a lot of times, like someone will have their arms crossed and then they start to get up and then the next shot, their arms won't be crossed and that's bad. But sometimes you have to do things like that because that's the only take that you have. Why is he crossing his arms? Anyone know what that's called? If you're consistent in every take, that's very like, you know what, when you said, I'm thirsty, you had your hand, you were itching your head in the last take. So can you do that same thing again? So everything has to be consistent. If it's not, there's a lack of continuity. Say, so have you guys heard that word before, continuity? So you, what you're looking, what the editors are looking for is as much continuity as possible. So they want it to be consistent. They want it to look the same. You guys have probably noticed that in films. Have you seen those? Like where he's like, oh, like what was it? Greatest Showman. At the end of Greatest Showman, um, Hugh Jackman, when he gets back together with his wife, he's hugging her. And then the next scene is his head on the other side of her, of her head. 
So they're, they're like, and, but nobody notices except editors who are looking and, and see it naturally now. But yeah, so that's, that's, that's a continuity issue. So editors try to avoid that, okay? And then so you're editing, you're mixing, like the music, you're mastering, okay? And part of this, huge part of this is music and effects, okay? So what I do as the sound guy is I get all the clips, well, I get all the clips, but the clips are recorded with the film camera and the microphone on the on a camera is always bad. It's never as good as a separate microphone. So um, I'm, you know, I have my boom mic and I'm recording all the audio when I was, as we're filming. And then I take that audio and I sync it. I match it up with the clips. So I drop in all the production audio and then I put in some sound effects because if you're booming, with this, sometimes you don't get enough of the other sound, like body movements, footsteps, and things like that. Um, so I'll add sound effects, like footsteps and things like that. And then of course, music is like the last thing that you do during post-production. So the film is usually done. Um, we call it locked. When it's locked, that means no more edits are allowed. So let's now we can put music to it, okay? Because what happens a lot, and we had to learn this the hard way, is I would put music to a scene and then you would cut out like five minutes of a scene later. All right, so a single file. Okay, back to this. So post-production is editing. Um, so video, sound, color, and effects. So coloring, video, um, those of you who've done photography too, it's um, it's not good enough to just take a picture of something or to film something. You have to color it. You have to make it more vibrant, but sometimes the color that you film is not realistic. It doesn't look like what it should look like. And that's uh, not because you have a bad camera, but you have to enhance it a little bit to make it look more realistic. And sometimes you want to take the realism out of it. You want it to be darker and subdued like a lot of James Bond movies have this green hue to the whole thing like it's just that cool little spy tint I guess but yes La La Land is very colorful too yeah La La Land's awesome there's another movie Rumblefish I think Matt it's an old movie Matt Dillon is in it but it's all black and white but then like I think just the fish is has a color to it. So that's a cool little effect. But when you color stuff, um, it's, it's, it's important. And you can tell when things haven't been colored or colored properly. Okay, so that's post-production. And then there's one more stage. And this is distribution. What's that? <laughs> distribution, okay. So this is uh, uh, where you would do screenings. Um, so a lot of times before they release a movie, they would do screenings. And then the purpose of screenings, you get feedback. I didn't understand that scene. What happened? Um, a lot of times the biggest mistake a filmmaker can make is not show it to anybody and then just release it because the filmmaker is looking through his own lens, literally, and doesn't realize that what's in his head hasn't been communicated to the film. So when you see, you understand the context of the film when you've made the film, right? But you have to look, you have to have people look at it who have no connection to you and what you're trying to do. Those are screenings. And then after feedback, you do more edits, okay? So a lot of time during screening, you won't have the music. A lot of time during screening, you'll have what we call temp music, all right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play something for you that's um, pretty cool, but in a, what happens is temp music is music that's done 
uh, just put in there that the editor puts in there or the director puts in there to communicate the feel of it. So a lot of times you can get royalty free music or whatever, or you even use music from other films that you think fits the scene that you're trying to do. And then the, the film score, the composer will take that and write his own thing, okay? So let me show you some temp music that one director used um, for his film to communicate to his um, composer. This is what I want it to sound like. See if you can figure out what movie this is. See if this works. See if you can hear. It. Sounds like Star Wars. This was written in the 1940s, this music. Isn't that crazy? So, I don't fault John Williams for doing this, but isn't it like, what? What was he thinking? It sounds just like that. It's called King's Row, and it's like an old, it's an old, his name's Eric Wolf, Wolfgang something, but he was the composer of this song called King's Row. And uh, so you can imagine that George Lucas was like, I want it to sound kind of like this. Can you do something kind of like this? Well, he kind of did. Because <laughs> it sounds almost identical, right? Um, but John Williams, this is what a lot of composers do. They don't argue with the director. You want it to sound like that? I'm going to make it sound like that. I'm going to change a little bit. But um, that's the easiest thing you can do. Like, as a film composer, you don't want to get, you don't want to argue with the director, okay? Because the director sees and hears something that you don't necessarily see and hear. You're not necessarily the expert. If you're the composer, you're not necessarily the expert on what it should sound like, okay? Uh, you need to take the director's lead on that. But, so John Williams definitely took the lead, but here's the deal with Star Wars. If you guys have followed behind the scenes of Star Wars at all, You'd, you'd remember that Star Wars was never, this was like a lost cause. The making of Star Wars, they were way over budget. Nobody, everybody thought this was a joke. What are you doing, George Lucas? We're making this movie. This is gonna be a bomb, okay? So nobody really took it seriously. Um, and I think maybe John Williams fell into that category. I'm like, okay, I'll make it sound like that. It's gonna shamelessly sound like that, but I'll make it sound like that. Now, of course, he did a lot, of, a lot more to that song and brought that film to life, but um, that's typically what a composer, composer's job is. It's not necessarily to be totally original. Um, now, you can put your own twist on something, but you have to follow the director's lead. So. Weird, right? Isn't that, I show that to people and they're like, what, no way. That was written in the 40s. Star Wars came out in 1977. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's move on to, well, well, let me just show you the rest of this development or distribution stage. So after this, um, there are mainstream processes. So after, so the way you want to distribute your movie so people can see it, there's mainstream, which is like theaters and things like that, right? So you want to put it, your goal is to get it in the theaters, then go to DVD, then online streaming, and then eventually like you can watch it free on TV or something, okay? So you want it in theaters. That's where you make millions, right? Theater, DVD, or hard copy, and then streaming. And then TV. Like, I think I saw Star Wars on TV when I was a teenager or something. Like, ooh, it's, it's that old. 
you know, it's really old. Yes, and I was just about to say that, that now these two are kind of flopping. But the thing with DVD, as a filmmaker, you get a royalty for every DVD that's sold. You know, sometimes you get half of what the, the DVD is worth or what it's sold for. Streaming, you get like a buck. You get cents. Every time someone streams it, you get cents. But here's the deal. Netflix will usually pay outright for something. For example, one of our films, uh, you guys familiar with Pure Flix? It's like Netflix, but it's a faith-based thing. Pure Flix. So Pure Flix bought our film for $25,000, one of our films. So a high school story. So they have the streaming rights for the next two years. So no one else can stream it, Prime or anything. They can't stream it, only Pure Flix. Um, so what happens is our distributor approached Net or Pure Flix and said, hey, we have this, what, is your, what, what can you offer us type of thing. So they offered $25,000 for ex exclusive rights. So we get half of that. And then that half gets split up into a bunch of stuff because we have to pay actors and, and cast and crew and things like that. So it's, um, that goes away real quick, but that's usually the process. So then, and then DVD is just kind of secondary at that point. But it used to be where you gotta, you gotta offer it on DVD first. And then when it's all done in the DVD market, when it's fizzled, that's when you put it, when you stream it, okay? So, and then to keep the interest flowing. But now some, of, some things are going directly to streaming um, because Netflix or Disney Channel or whatever, Disney Plus or whatever will, will buy it. Um, and so you're not really losing money at that point because these streaming platforms are desperate for content, okay? So they're always looking for content. So this it's a good business to get into right now. Um, not a streamer, but actually making movies. Okay, so, um, and then you can go the low budget process. And this is what we did with our first film. Remember, we had the lowest budget of any film that I know of, $2,500. I've never heard of a film being made for less than that. Um, so low budget process. You can do like film festivals if you want. Film festivals, that's nice because you can get the nice little laurels, you know, the wings. So if you're nominated for best film or something, um, you can put those on the DVD cover. So if you guys seen covers like that where you see the wings, those are called laurels. Those are the awards and nominations that uh, film sees and you get those at film festivals. This last film that we did, um, uh, our film Sleeper Agent was nominated at a, a couple different film festivals, uh, International Christian Film Festival is like the biggest one. And so I was nominated for best, for best composer. So um, I didn't win, but I was nominated. But that nomination comes with laurels. So I can put that on my resume. I was nominated uh, for best film score. Um, and, and then we were nominated again for another one. The festival hasn't happened yet, but anyway. But, oh yeah, did I mention I won an Emmy? <laughs> okay, so that can go on the cover too. If it was a movie, it would go on the cover. Well, actually, Emmys don't go with movies. They go with television, but anyway. All right, keep looking at my math notes. So the low budget option, you can go to film festivals and then you go right to DV, so straight to DVD, that's what we did with the perfect cord. And and then they just distributed it. They distributed it all over the world. And we've, uh, if I do some quick math, we put $2,500 into it. Um, it's sold probably close to $300,000 worth of copies, but we would, we'd only get like a small fraction of that. So maybe like 70-ish, 70, 70 to 100,000 over the last five years. So every quarter we get a royalty check and then Nathan and I split that. And so yeah, sometimes we get like $1,000, sometimes we get $200, it depends on what it, but it's doing really well. And like I said, we've definitely gotten back what we've put, in, put into it. So now that's the low budget option. You can go straight to DVD. 
And then after DVD, you can put it on um, online for, you know, streaming or whatever. But our movies have been hacked so many times too. So uh, yeah, I think you can watch A Perfect Chord on YouTube for free because somebody hacked it and put it on there. So anyway, don't do that. If you want to watch it, you can watch it on Prime. You can also watch it on Pure Flix and things like that too. But anyway, that's the distribution process. Pre-production is something. And then after post-production is something. What's that? That's the final cut. They both start with a D. So there's, you don't have to name it this way, but it's usually what people refer to. Before pre-production, there's the... Do. Development. development and then after post-production is the distribution all right okay good you just needed a little nudge in the right direction so we're gonna talk we're gonna just finish lesson one here um we're talking about the filmmaking process but um, it's great to have an idea good intentions but you need some tech you need some tools okay so what are the tools like camera microphone. yeah camera would be nice wouldn't it so this is still lesson one continued editing software editing software yes absolutely do the actors count yeah, you need some cast, and, but as far as tools, oh. so here's some tools. So here's the filmmaking tools. Now this is just probably a minimum, but prioritized list of what you need, okay? So I would say video camera. We're gonna talk about the different types of cameras, but um, you need to be able to shoot video, right? Um, I would, microphone is definitely a priority. The cameras that come on, cam, or the microphones that come on video cameras are very, what's the word? Poopy, okay? So don't use that. Even if it's a nice camera, nice microphone that's attached to a camera, it's still attached to the electronics of the camera and there's a lot of interference that could potentially happen. So it's better to have a separate audio system. So a microphone is awesome. You need something to record that microphone with as well, but that's, um, that's kind of what we're talking about when we're um, talking about just the microphone, the whole sound setup. All right, then you need a light source. You can't film in the dark. You can film outside. You can film in low light, but you can't film in no light. Okay, you need uh, some, some type of editing tool. All right, editing tool. So back in the old days, they, uh, the term cut and paste came from filmmaking. It came from the audio and the, uh, film mm -hmm. industry because they would literally cut film and paste it to overdub on top of another so it's that's what they used to use now we do that digitally which is much easier and nicer um but there was if, if someone shot in actual film sometimes a full feature length film even and this is including all the takes that they didn't use would be like miles long sometimes okay um so it's nice to do it digitally but it does take up a lot of space um, digitally. So um, the other thing that you would probably need is some kind of tripod. If you're gonna, if you can just do handheld the whole time, that's that's great. But it's nice to have stationary shots as well, especially when you're doing visual effects. If you if you're doing visual effects, like sometimes like a like a cloning thing, um, if you have two of yourself on film, you can do that by just but they have to, the camera has to be in the same exact position the whole time. So you can do a little cloning shot if you wanted to, 
and just edit it that way. The lighting has to be the same. It has to be angled the same way, but you can do a little cloning shot. Maybe we can do that a little later and I can show you um, how that works. It's pretty fun. All right, and then speaking of miles and miles of film, we need some type of media storage. Okay, so um, on a lot of like the DSLRs, you'll have like an SD card and things like that. Um, on more expensive cameras, they'll have actual hard drives that they record right onto. And, um, and here's the deal. And we're gonna talk about this later though, but when you have storage, it's not good enough to have storage. You need to back up your storage and make backups of your backups. There's been so too many times where we've lost footage and we've had to reshoot um, a scene or two because we lost the footage, we accidentally erased it. We're trying to, especially when we're desperate for space, I need more space on my hard drive. So I have to delete stuff that we didn't use. Oh, that's from a, I already have copies of that. Oops, I didn't. It was just labeled the same and I just, I just deleted all Saturday's film shoot. That stinks when that happens, but it happens more times than you would think, okay? And then of course, um, on set especially, you need a pair of headphones. Uh, you, if you don't, if you're not monitoring how things are sounding, then that's dangerous. That's really risky. If you don't know what it's sounding like, you might have some major interference happening by your recorder. Maybe your recorder is by like a light switch that has a dimmer on it. Whenever that's the case, there's there's interference. Do you guys ever like have your phone by a speaker and then it makes funny noises? There's stuff like that everywhere, but you won't hear it unless you have headphones or some type of thing. You don't want on, especially during production, you don't want anything but headphones because you don't want it to bleed out of speakers or anything. You want to be able to hear it, but you don't want anyone else to hear it, okay? Um, so those are the basic tools for uh, filmmaking, okay? So, um, and then I add on here, this is all of lesson one. So you're gonna work on the, uh, uh, in that lights, camera, what? Most of you guys have done that. Um, here's what I'd love to see. If you guys are up for, if you guys have a camera that you use at home, I'd love for you to bring that on Thursday so I can see it. And for those of, for Nick, you're at home and Annika, if you wanna show me a picture of what you're filming with, and if it's your phone, it's really hard to take a picture of your phone, so you don't have to do that. You can just let me know what you're filming with. That'd be great. Yes, Gabe. What if it's just like a, a cheap version of a GoPro? Because that's the only camera I have. That's awesome. Phone. That's awesome. So um, you don't have to bring it, if you, but I'd love to see it if it's worth showing me. But if it's just like, well, there's not much to it. It's just a GoPro type of thing. Yeah, but those are like really small. And yeah, big. that's great. Um, so what have you shot with that? Like, what have you done with that? Um, I filmed a few YouTube videos. Uh huh. Um, that's it. And now, is does that record audio as well? Yes, it's decent audio. I mean, it's still built in. Yeah. But I mean, you can hear the audio through the case and stuff because I have a yeah. case for it, and it it works. Yeah, it's just not ideal. Yeah. Um, so cool. Well, we're going to go over how to get good audio on top of that as well. But sometimes, especially if you're close enough, like this is what a lot of people learned during this pandemic when they were trying to stream together and do Zoom calls and things like that. If the camera's close, like these microphones on these iPhones are pretty decent, but you have to be close. If you're not close, then you get too much reverberation of the room and it sounds cheap and gross and I don't like it, okay? But, um, so what we'll do, and I'm gonna bring in some microphones and I'm gonna show you all about shotgun microphones and things like that. Uh, those are ideal for filming because they ice, they kind of, they muffle out the rest of the environment and just focus. That's why they call them shotgun. Um, I guess shotgun's relative because it, shotgun actually spreads out stuff, but it's not exact, but um, it does focus in on your subject, so the dialogue is a lot crisper, okay? And I love crispy dialogue. That's what 
That's the term I use a lot on set is let's make it sound crispy.